Right, hello everybody and thank you Heather for allowing me back. Um, after so many great speakers, I am sure you are having an absolutely great time and hopefully you're now ready to step back into Tudor England on this really wet, cold day here in Norfolk and take part in my dessert course, The Banquet, here in the Great Hall, where in the early 1500s, Sir Edward Chamberlain and his wife would have thrown many feasts and banquets. Now, um, unlike today, the banquet in Tudor times only referred to the very last part of the feast, which was um, more or less a dessert course and by special invitation only. The term banquet derives from the Italian word bancetto, hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, which is a small uh, side table or bench on which the food was served. Uh, the first time the word banquet appeared um, in print in its plural form, banquetis, was actually in 1483 um, in Caxton's edition of the Golden Legend. Now, during uh, Henry the uh, seventh reign, um, the feast incorporated sweet as well as savory dishes. Uh, and they sat, sat side by side. And at the end of a feast, um, the arrival of the so-called void um, signaled to all the people that the end of the feast feast has come and they would get up and the staff would come and clear the table and take them away. And during that process called the void, the diners got up and they enjoyed a drink of Hippocrates in very fancy Italian glassware. And uh, with that drink, they would have uh, a last minute nibble, nipple, which is um, wafers. They came either looking like this or that. We talk about them a little bit later. And also something called comfits, which are sugar glazed uh, seeds. Uh, by the 1540s, things started to change. And in fact, by the 1550s, the chronicler Hall uses the word banquet as a synonym for the older French term of the void. And interestingly, by the second half of the 16th century, so we're talking Elizabethan times, with the increasing availability of sugar and the ever-growing range of uh, sweet foodstuffs available, the banquet became all the rage amongst the nobility. Uh, its chief purpose was to impress with lavish dramatic displays and to show off the host's wealth, power and good taste, of course. Um, only the most costly and rarest foods, such as, uh, such as expensive spices or imported dried fruits and sugar were served at such banquets. The food had to sell wealth, power, influence, and most importantly, sex. So a true Tudor knockout in the very sense. Uh, 
And one of uh, the main attractions of this banquet was also that it provided the people with privacy and it was taken away from the prying eyes and ears of the servants. So very much the Tudor style of clubbing, if you might like to call it that. Uh, you see, during a feast, the diners were seated according to their position and standing and in society. And in the following banquet course, however, there was a lot much more freedom of choice where you wanted to sit and who you wanted to talk about. However, dietary authors generally were very hostile to what they considered the grossly extravagant and unruly banqueting habits of the courtiers. And in Henry the Eighth time, the, the banquet started to move away from the feasting scene held here in the Great Hall to a much warmer and private place somewhere else in the house. That could be the great chamber upstairs or uh, a withdrawing room, which in our case is that way, and now my library. Uh, and from those banqueting rooms, it really was only a small step to the banqueting houses. Uh, the most famous banqueting house featured at Hampton Court, no surprise there really you'd say. Uh, it was built by Henry in 1527 to entertain the French ambassadors and sadly uh, was demolished in the 17th century. Uh, and during the reign of Elizabeth I, many of these banqueting rooms actually moved to the rooftop um, uh, as seen at Hardwick Hall, if you've been there before. And sometimes they move those banqueting rooms into a cave, uh, such as a grotto they often created and then decorated with little shells. But my personal favorite one uh, must be the one that Francis Bacon had on his little island sat in the moat, which he had designed in the ancient Roman style. The earliest banqueting houses were of a very, a very temporary design. And the field of cloth. Now about the food. Uh, Banqueting food was made not by the cook, but by skilled artisans, the so-called confectioners. And of course, Henry VIII had his own confectionery at Hampton Court. And um, the interesting thing for me is that during the late 16th century, so Elizabethan times, um, the lady of the house started to make these confections, just as the confections and their popularity spread down the social scale. For those who neither had the time or the skill to make any of these, uh, you could also purchase them in specialty shops as the accounts of two families in particular, the, Wil uh, the Wilbur's and the Middleton family show us clearly. Now let's explore some of the food that was actually served because I was busy in the kitchen. I prepared 
quite a nice <laughs> palette for you because you need to see them. I'm, I'm sorry you can't smell them or taste them on this occasion, but let's have a look at what there was. Basically, we have two groups. We have the subtleties and we have the uh, sweet meats. Let's start with the subtleties. And I'm going to reach over here and I'm going to show you some. The subtleties were basically table ornaments uh, and all made from sugar paste. Let me just bring it up a bit better like this. I hope you can see. Uh, so the sugar paste was made from ground sugar, gum dragon, egg white and liquid. And most of the time that was rose water. Um, this paste then dried hard, uh, white, and was often painted. Now my very, very talented daughter made these out of sugar paste. Um, you can see, for instance, uh, a very popular one was cards, playing cards made of sugar paste. Uh, we have animals here. I think that's a deer she made or a wolf. Um, the most uh, elaborate and costly and impressive uh, subtleties were usually served at important state entertainments. For instance, at the Field of Cloth of Gold, you, Henry VIII would have been shown, I have to put it down now because it's getting so heavy, and I'll bring them out individually. So at the Field of Cloth of Gold, you would have had the Salamander, you would have had uh, the Ermine, here is a nice ermine that my daughter again made, all from sugar paste. I don't know what I will do without her. <laughs> you really need an artisan to make them. Uh, a very popular one was the chessboard. And you can see here, oops, my daughter made these out of marzipan actually. And uh, every single figurine, Oops, silly, <laughs> is made to two models of chess sets uh, from the Viennese Museum in Vienna. Now, let's put them back here. Um, now, the sweet and, and all of those were mostly served in between courses as part of the main feast. Uh, what you're going to see now would have been served at the banquet only. And we have the different groups again. Uh, first of all, I'm going to show you the group of suck kids. What a name you might say. And we have wet suck kids and we have dry suck kids. Now to make you, to help you see, uh, I'll bring over a plate full of wet sockets. Oops. It's just such a shame you can't taste them because they are really to die for. I hope you can see them. I'm just going to uh, take this one off for the moment. They are very colourful. Now wet sockets are basically various fruits preserved in sugar syrup and then served with a two pronged socket fork, a little bit like this one. Uh, but the original ones would have had a spoon at the end to spoon the sweet um, juice with. Uh, now, I've, I found a little picture on Google that shows an original one. I hope you can see. I don't own one, sorry. <laughs> uh, they are very rare. If you find one, go buy it. Uh, and um, here we have a very famous one. This is 
pears in wine, and they were often served in very, very expensive glasswork from Italy. Now, this is only a uh, reproduction, uh, but just look at that. It looks absolutely fabulous, doesn't it? This, these gla class glass works would have been imported from Italy in particular. Anyway, I'll put that to one side for the moment. So also uh, apple mousse is part of a wet socket. Um, as long as you needed to use uh, something to eat it with, it was a wet socket. I'm going to now show you some of the dry sockets. Let me just put this out of the way again. Otherwise I am fighting for space here. How cool would it be if you could be all sitting around me and tucking in? <laughs> right, dry sockets. Um, well, have a look here. Uh, dry sockets were prepared in the same way. So uh, it's fruit that was um, then um, boiled in syrup, but then allowed to dry be dried and then boxed up. And what they used was a wooden box such as this one. Camembert often comes in that type of box these days. But in Tudor England, uh, this is how you would have bought it. Now, right, let's have a look at what a dry socket is. So you have candied fruit. Here I've candied some cherries. Um, fruit peels, orange peel, these are absolutely to die for, and they keep forever, it's brilliant. Uh, or fruit pastes, like this one that's made from cherry, uh, and marmalade. Now marmalade, this is Tula marmalade, it's a dry socket, you don't need spoons or anything, it's actually, look, it's not sticky at all. And um, uh, a Tudor marmalade, um, the word marmalade comes from the Portuguese word for quince, more mellow. And that because the first ones were made from quince, uh, hence we still have the name marmalade. But you uh, also get all sorts of other fruits like, uh, or um, roots like ginger, um, uh, medlar, yeah, and um, this was considered really healthy, even though it's full of sugar, because the Tudor, in, in Tudor age, the notion was that fruit was full of water and therefore um, moist and cold, and that was considered harmful to the body. But by cooking it and by adding lots of sugar, you corrected that into something healthy. So therefore it became some superfood that wasn't just to show off, but it also helped you stay healthy. Uh, then we have Tudor, oops, here goes my little decoration. Uh, here you have um, some March, um, 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 not March, but uh, gingerbread. He, uh, the red gingerbread and the white gingerbread. And uh, the uh, red gingerbread uh, was made from um, stale uh, bread crumbs, ginger, sugar, licorice, anise, and red wine. And the early ones contained pepper instead of ginger. The white gingerbread here, I hope you can see it, was made, funny enough, from marzipan, um, aqua vita, uh, ginger, and then was molded, dried, and frequently gilded. And I have indeed gilded it with real gold, which you can buy here. Um, then the all famous March pain. And uh, uh, March pain 
was a confection made from sugar and ground almonds, uh, was often baked on a base of wafers and glazed with rose water and sugar. And these were often also the showpieces at banquets. For instance, my chessboard is made of March, uh, March paint. And they obviously were also painted. And marzipan was just really the almond and the sugar basis to these March paints. Now, let's quickly look at some Tudor biscuits. <laughs> Here we have, oops, I have to make sure I'm not losing some of them. Here we have a plate full of uh, Tudor biscuits. Uh, they started to appear in Elizabethan times and were double cooked. Uh, that means that the dough was first boiled and then baked. Hence you get this lovely round form because the dough was wrapped in muslin, then boiled, then taken out, cut into slices, baked and glazed with sugar. Um, then I've got the macaroons here. These are actually lovely. I love those. And the all famous jumbles, exactly. Uh, and the cracknels. Now, the cracknels, as the sounds suggest, make a cracking sound when you bite into it. And if you're lucky, it was the biscuit that made the sound and not your tooth. Yeah, they're very hard. And then we have got also lovely tarts to the tarts. And if they are closed with pastry, they are pies and those are really, really delicious. Um, and these here are Tudor cakes. I don't know whether you can see. And the Tudor cakes are rather dense, a little bit more like bread than our fluffy cakes. Uh, they all include spices and a lot of them dried fruit, uh, like the Twelfth Night Cake, which is this one here. And in 1577, Hollinshed referred to this sugar bread here as one of the ma many outlandish confections indulged by the gentry. Now, let me show you the wafers again, because the wafers are part of the original medieval void and they are so iconic really for Tudor England and banquets. Um, and you could get them in rolled up versions like this or more commonly like those. Now how do you make them with this lovely design in the middle? You might ask yourself. Let me show you. This here is a Tudor waffle maker. Can you see the lovely design? So the batter goes in here, you close it up, you put it into the embers and out comes this. And it, it, it does, it's a little bit hard, but they did dunk it into the hippocras. So it was actually quite nice. Um, the last section I take you through is the comfits, because the comfits, as we've seen before, <laughs> just scattered them all over my um, table here. These um, are basically um, sugar coated either nuts like I've got over here, oops, let's add them here, like that, or um, spices. 
And um, the word confits in itself derived again from the Italian, uh, from the Italian word confetti. And the word confit is banquet and goes back to the 1330s and was first applied to gingerbread confections. But by the 16th century, uh, a comfit became a sweet meat, really, um, and included not just spices, but nuts uh, um, as well. These are made from fennel, by the way. They could uh, be colored or white, um, sometimes red, yellow, or, or green. And comfits uh, were known in England by, the, uh, by this particular name by 1480. But from about uh, the mid century in the 16th century, uh, you would see them a lot more in London uh, where there were specialist shops. Uh, funny enough, uh, mostly run by aliens and aliens meaning obviously foreigners from Spain. Uh, and um, the most famous one is Balthasar Sons, who became very rich selling comfits to the Londoners and English people. Uh, comfits um, and sweetmeats, so all of these were actually very well received uh, and highly regarded gifts. Um, we know, for instance, that um, between Edward, Lord Edward uh, Stanley and the master of the horse, Robert Dudley, uh, they included always comfits. And we also know from Robert Dudley's accounts that he was very much self-indulging in comfits and spent a lot more money than he should have done, uh, even before 1579. And uh, such sweet delights were also used as bribery uh, to keep influential people sweet. Uh, and um, food, and in particular sweet food, um, played a significant political role uh, in form of banquets and food gifts. And the authorities tried to control and regulate this excess consumption through means of sumptuary laws, but not always very successfully, as we know. And before we've come to the end of my little talk, I'm going to show you something very special and very iconic for banqueting food. You can't eat it, but it's a feast to the eye. Here, I have a little box, a wooden box. What it is, it's an Elizabethan trencher or roundel box. What's inside? Inside, you get 10, 12 or 20, 24 little roundels like that. Now, what did you do with these, you might ask yourself? Well, I always say that's the Tudor equivalent to the Christmas cracker, the one where you pull and you open it, it goes bang, and then you read to each other the little joke or whatever is inside. This works quite like that, only it's a lot more beautiful. What happened is, that you would use the plain side to eat your stuff from. So you load up, you go and you load yourself up. So you eat this and at the end of it, when conversation runs a bit dry, perhaps you would then be asked in turns to turn it over and you would read that this motto or poem or verse, or sometimes it's uh, even a little story out to the rest of the group. Uh, and that's what you did. Uh, 
but I think they're absolutely lovely. Uh, and the, uh, you can see them in many museums. I know there's one uh, in um, the British Museum, but I have seen a set, if I remember correctly, uh, at the Met in New York as well. And yes, that's the end. So if you have any questions,